Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be covering topic 6.3, which is fuel sources and their uses. Our objective for the day is to be able to identify the different types of fuel sources and identify their major uses. The skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will be describing an environmental concept or process. So the first category of fuels we'll talk about are subsistence fuels. This should look familiar from video 6.2, but as a recap, these are just biomass fuels that are easily available, so they can be found and gathered, and they're oftentimes used as fuel for heating a home or for cooking. Wood and charcoal are probably the two most common subsistence fuels or biomass fuels globally, and they're going to be, again, easily accessible. You can find wood you know, in a forest, cut it down. It's often free or very cheap to purchase, and so this is going to be a really common fuel source around the world. Uh, charcoal is another fuel source and charcoal is actually made from wood. So when you put wood in a fire or in sort of a stove apparatus here and heat it or burn it for a long period of time under low oxygen conditions, you eventually create charcoal. Charcoal is really light, so it's easy to transport and it's easy to buy a lot of it at once. And so charcoal is a really uh, solid alternative as well when it comes to subsistence or biomass fuels. And then finally, we have peat. Uh, peat is basically the decaying, broken down organic matter that's found in watery, acidic soils. So these would be found in marshes, bogs, or sometimes we call them moors. And basically what happens is over time, uh, the vegetation of the marsh is going to die. It's going to fall you know, down to the bottom of the water. It's going to be compressed by overlaying uh, soil and sediment layers, and it gets compressed into peat. And again, peat is just kind of you know, partially decomposed mostly dried organic matter. And then you can dig it up and dry it out into kind of little bricks like this. And then it's gonna be a great subsistence. And now we'll talk about coal formation. And so we're gonna pick up right where we left off with peat. So in coal formation, we basically have peat that is being compressed by overlying rock layers or sediments into coal over long periods of time. So all of that heat and that pressure of the overlying rock is going to basically squeeze all of the excess water the excess air, any other you know, materials out of the peat, and we're basically left with just hydrocarbons or just coal. And so it's important to note here that the longer a coal deposit is pressurized from the overlying rock layers and the deeper in the ground, the more energy dense it's going to be. And so we have some names for different densities of coal here. We have lignite, bituminous, and anthracite. And that goes in order from least dense. You can remember lignite is least dense to most dense, anthracite, and, you know, A is right at the beginning of the alphabet. So there's a way to remember that. Now it's important to point out that these deeper coal reserves that are buried underneath more rock layers have more pressure on them. And that pressure basically compacts them and makes them more energy dense. Now this is important because energy density is very relevant to value and to how much energy is released. So the more energy dense a coal source is, the more energy is released when that coal source is burned. So that means that anthracite is going to be the most valuable coal source. When you burn anthracite, it releases a lot more energy you know, per unit than either of the other types of coal. And it's actually gonna be cleaner as well. There are fewer impurities in it because it's been compressed for so much longer. So the impurities have kind of been squeezed out. You can think of that analogy there to help you. And then finally, uh, what we do with this coal is burn it and that energy that's released is primarily used to heat water into steam. That steam is forced through a tunnel uh, that's going to turn a turbine, and that turbine powers a generator, which makes electricity. So remember back from video 6.2, the number one use of coal globally is going to be electricity production. And so because the more dense our coal is, the hotter and the longer it'll burn, that basically means that it can produce more electricity, and so that's why it's more valuable. Next, we'll talk about natural gas. Natural gas is formed from the decaying remains of mostly marine organisms uh, that are buried underneath layers of rock and sediment, and they're converted into oil and natural gas by the pressure of those overlying rock sediments over millions of years. So it takes a long time for these to form. Uh, natural gas is going to be mostly methane, which is CH4. And again, it's going to be found on top of trapped oil deposits. So we have a diagram here in a second that'll help us out. But first, we need to know that this forms basically when an oil deposit is trapped in a porous sedimentary rock, such as sandstone. And then on top of it, there's a hard impermeable cap rock. 
and that does not allow the natural gas that forms on top of that oil to escape. So then it forms a deposit that humans can eventually extract. So we'll take a look at this diagram here. Again, oil and natural gas are going to be primarily formed from the remains of marine organisms. So that means organisms that lived in the ocean. So we have, you know, plants and fish that live in the ocean. They die and their bodies drift to the bottom and they become buried in sedimentary rocks. So think back to the carbon cycle, the act of sedimentation. And then over time, all of these layers above the sedimentary rock are going to compress those fossilized remains. That's why we call them fossil fuels, uh, compresses them into oil and natural gas. And what happens is when we have a porous sedimentary rock here, the oil and the natural gas can kind of sit in those gaps in the rock. But then we have a hard impermeable cap rock above, cap rock above that doesn't allow the natural gas to escape. And so then as humans, you know, we can dig this up by drilling down through all of those layers of impermeable rock. And then we can pipe off the natural gas or pump up the oil. It's also important that we know that natural gas is considered the cleanest fossil fuel. By cleanest, we mean that it releases the fewest air pollutants when it's burned uh, to release energy, and also that it produces far less CO2 than other forms of fossil fuel. So we have a table here that'll help us understand some of those big differences. Uh, it's gonna produce about half as much CO2 as coal, so it's gonna be far less warming to the atmosphere than coal. It still does release CO2, but far less. It's gonna release virtually no particulate matter, so virtually no soot or ash. That's really important for human health. It's gonna be a lot better in terms of the respiratory problems that coal causes. So it's not gonna worsen asthma or bronchitis to the same degree as coal. It's gonna have far less sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. That's really important for acid rain and also for human respiratory systems. And then most importantly, it releases no mercury. So there's not gonna be any mercury in the ash that's left over because there really isn't any ash left over like there is with coal. So all of these sort of factors here contribute to natural gas being a far cleaner fossil fuel than coal and oil. And now we'll talk about crude oil, uh, which is also referred to as petroleum. So we should already know from the last slide here that this is the decaying remains of organic matter that's trapped underneath rock layers and then compressed over millions of years into oil. And again, this is why we call them fossil fuels because they're the fossilized remains of organisms, you know, primarily animals and plants that lived in the ocean. So they're going to be extracted, or oil is extracted, I should say, by drilling through this overlying rock layer that's impermeable to reach this permeable layer of rock that contains the oil. And then the oil can be pumped out under pressure. So you can see here that this can be done either in the ocean uh, or on land, basically anywhere where you can find an oil deposit underneath the ground. But a more uh, environmentally damaging way of extracting oil that's becoming increasingly common as we run short of other reserves is from tar sands. And so tar sands are basically a mixture of sand and clay and water and a substance called bitumen. Now bitumen is basically tar. You can think of it as this kind of thick, uh, sticky, almost like semi-solid uh, petroleum reserve. So it's not going to be liquid like petroleum is or like crude oil is. It's not going to flow easily. And so that leads to us having to use a lot of water to extract it. And so water is turned into steam and that steam is piped into the ground basically to melt that bitumen into a more free flowing substance that can then be piped up to the surface. So that takes a lot of energy to turn all of that water into steam. It takes a lot of water to create all of that steam. And then even more water is needed at the refinery to separate all those impurities out of the bitumen. And so again, we can create oil in this way and Canada, especially the Alberta region is producing a lot of tar sands now as other oil reserves are running lower, but it's really, really energy intensive. It's really, really water intensive. So we need to know that this is a more environmentally uh, consequential way of producing oil. And finally, we'll talk about some major end products for crude oil or for petroleum. So it's going to be converted into a lot of different products through a process called fractional distillation. So in fractional distillation, uh, petroleum will be burned in a furnace, and that's going to turn that petroleum, that liquid, into a vapor. And that vapor will then pass into a column where the different hydrocarbons that are found in petroleum will be separated based on their boiling points. So if we take a look at this diagram here, we can kind of understand this a little better. We have crude oil, which again is going to be in a liquid form. We also call it petroleum. 
it's put into this furnace uh, through a tube here where it's going to be burned or heated to such a degree that it's going to vaporize. It's going to turn into a gas. Then it goes into this big column here. And this column has a bunch of different sections kept at different temperatures. The hotter temperatures are at the bottom, cooler temperatures are at the top. And what happens is the different hydrocarbons in petroleum will separate out because of their boiling points. So the hydrocarbons that have a really high by a really high boiling point will separate out at the bottom. We'll get products like bitumen that we can use for asphalt on roads. And the hydrocarbons with really low boiling points will go to the top and they'll separate out into products like petroleum gas or the gasoline that we use in our cars. So again, as I mentioned here, there's going to be a lot of end uses for petroleum and we'll run through some of them quickly. Uh, number one, probably most familiar to all of us is gasoline. So the fuel that we put in our cars, of course, comes from petroleum or from crude oil, which is that starting material. But we also get a ton of other products. We get a product called naphtha, which is used to make plastics. So virtually all plastics that you encounter are going to have originated with some fossil fuel input, with some crude oil input. Uh, we also have jet fuel. We have diesel fuel for large trucks. We have motor oil, so the lubricating oil that you put in your motor to keep it running smoothly. Uh, and then finally, we have bitumen, which again is going to be used in asphalt, on our roads, on our sidewalks. And so we have all of these different products that come from this crude oil or from petroleum. So our practice FRQ for topic 6.3 today is going to involve the skill of describing an environmental process or concept. And so I want you to explain here two environmental benefits of using natural gas as a fuel source compared to using coal. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful. Subscribe for future APES video updates and check out other notes over here to the side. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar.